welcome to Chopped Greens. I am your host, Philip Van Ryan, sitting alongside my giggly friend, Gary Boucher. Giggling uh, Gary. G- <laughs> Don't say that. That sounds terribly creepy. Well, hi kids, it's Giggling Gary. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I'm shoot sorry. a pickle. That was that was quite <laughs> fascinating. This well, is pet me blue and call me bay. We just saw Wonder Woman. Yes, we did. We did, as a matter of fact. Yes. And I'm still bitter about it. You're uh, bitter I, about I am it. I'm so mad that you got me to see this movie. Is like, like a good man, like oh, I actually kind of liked it, or like a I it sucked as much as I thought right, it would. All right, let's break it down. Let's go. So. I remember watching DC and watching The Dark Knight, right? The, and yes, that that was before it was the DC Extended Universe. That's when correct. it was just the Dark Knight trilogy. Correct. It, yeah. was, it was a standalone. And I'm thinking, wow, this is fantastic. This is the start of something new. I can't wait for Dark, Dark Knight Rises. As soon as Dark Knight Rises ends, the next film, I'm thinking, and you hear the announcements of upcoming DC movies. Yeah. It's an automatic, okay, so they're finally going to fight with Marvel. They're they're going to be the next big thing, and it's just going to create this big <laughs> Golden State Warriors to Cleveland Cavaliers. Wow, what a reference! Yes! Except it is this year where Marvel is the 2017 Golden State Warriors, and DC is the 2017 Cavs. And, be- and the reason why, for those of them who are not sports fans... Marvel has just been coming out with hit after hit, including the Black Panther, mm-hmm. which is Building we just saw first and trailer for uh, on the NBA Finals. DC has been hitting itself after hitting itself with just god awful movies, and they dug themselves to a terrible hole. They're a joke of a franchise. Batman too. versus Superman was the epitome, was the epitomization of how pitiful yes. this whole franchise has been thus far. Man of Steel was not as bad as I thought it was, but it was no. pretty bad. Yeah. And if it, anything, Man of I mean, Batman vs Superman was, was bad. Mm-hmm. Suicide Squad was terrible. Man of Steel was just okay, just generic, bland. Blah. Yes. So we go and we finally hit Wonder Woman. I am nowhere near excited to see this. I'm I I. You can expect something with a good Rotten Tomato score. I try to not live off of it because there have been plenty of movies mm-hmm. that I've enjoyed without it. Playing good movies that I've thought, why? Why did this get a good review? Walk in. I walked out. Are you ready for this? Yes. Lay it on me. Pleasantly surprised. Hi! Uh, I knew it. I knew you would Uh, at least enjoy it. I, I couldn't help it. It's... If you do not have the hype... Machine behind it is probably better. Yeah. It's a pleasant surprise. I, I I tried not to jump on the hype train either for this because you know y- you never know. I mean th- I mean people were like this is the, the 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 greatest superhero movie I've ever seen. And I'm like all right, all right no, but so much better than any of the content Warner Bros DC universe has put out in the past five years. And really, so that's the, much better. That's I think the key. It's the amplifier. Yes. To why it was so good in in recognition. That of among how, I mean among you know obvi- obvious social and cultural reasons. Right, right. We'll, but, we'll, we'll yeah. definitely tackle those in a minute. But just staying on this topic, it is the amplifier, the multiplier of why it was so good. It, it, it's the mm. times two of. Because Batman vs. Superman was so god awful. They needed just at least an okay movie just to breathe some hope. If it was just a solid five movie, just a middle of the pack movie, it would have been better because then you at least see a trajectory, a right path, and really it's wow, you know, this is, they're going, they're getting better and they're recognizing their mistakes working on it. But this movie was so good that. It almost makes me antsy. It, it gives me that it where it's it's an aberration from from their past work, yeah. and so it makes me nervous. I mean that I'm going to get sucked in again, and that I'm going to say, "Hey, Justice League looks really good. I want to no, go see it." Don't fall and then for you it. Go, Justice and then League it's going to be, be an terrible. awful movie where both moms are somehow become the main plot point <laughs> of a movie. I. I, Not to say that moms aren't important, but when but, that's the simple reason, just knowing that you're, both of your moms have the same name is the main reason on why you don't continue to fight. That's just, that's just, oh, that's so frustrating. What was the mom's name again? L- Linda, Linda? Lisa or Lisa. something? Oh. Lisa. Lisa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so bad. You know, I actually have here in my notes, I, I said, excellent DC movie, middle of the pack at best Marvel movie. 
you know, th- this reminded me, um, it had a lot of parallels to Captain America, the first Avenger, the one that came out in either 09 or 2011, I believe it was, uh, I think 2011, and a lot of similar feel, like that had like that kind of hunky-dory origin story, World War II setting. Captain America, the first Avenger is a fine movie, but compared to the rest of the stuff, it's not, it's not even close. It's just a fun little movie. That's how this one felt. Right. Quick to aside, me. Yeah. Martha. Martha. That, yes, that, I mean, was, that was the mother name for Bob. Martha. Know, everybody was waiting like, on Hank, you know. Like, what is it? finger of knowing what it was. Anyways. Martha. You're making an excellent point, actually. Yeah. I, that, that was an exact facsimile of what I saw when looking at this. I was thinking in my head, this must be a... This might be the formula to which all superhero movies now must yeah. adhere to. And that's kind of what they've been doing in a Marvel side of the universe. Yeah. Of creating... Almost a James Bond, a spy-like film, that where you it has a tone of realism with a a, a dash, a flair of superheroism. DC definitely um, now, has a hand, a, a clump of uh, what you could call flair. <laughs> well, they have yes, a, a they, taste they have, for the wondrous and they the are spectacle. a bit eccentric. But yes. with Captain America, the the entire the the trilogy, I believe now of well, yeah yes, the trilogy that what made each one successful was the spy film element that you had in each one, where it felt very much uh, James Bond, very much uh, Jason Bourne. It had a, that realism yeah. factor to it. Not not quite the Dark Knight, where it was an entire completely gritty city. like film noir kind of feel. Yeah. Right, it, it, but it had a very realistic approach to it, yeah. and this Wonder Woman definitely held true to that form. And I, th- Morse, and I think that that's I mean, what everybody's going to adhere to. It's, in it's the funny because if if you look at it by itself, I would disagree with you. But when you compare it to the last two or three DC movies, this is by far the most realistic, and that goes without saying that in the action sequences, every other shot was a CGI cluster of slow motion madness. That I, and so if we can sit here and say that it was you know, realistic and gritty, that's actually a huge improvement considering that it itself is not. And, you know? and the true challenge is, because it's not – there a lot of this movie going into it, you kind of have a feeling of knowing how it's going to turn out. Even the beginning is a flashback yeah. because – they already introduced the character of Wonder Woman. Yep. Ruined her entrance. Uh, in in Batman last, versus Superman, yeah. which was awful. So you know at the very least that she lives. So there is yeah. so there is a grain of salt here that I'm not for, uh, spoiling anything, no. really. But what I'm worried about is that in the next Justice League, in the next maybe standalone Wonder Woman, because I guarantee you there's going to be another Wonder Woman movie. Yeah, which uh, will be my, hopefully fun. My, yeah, no. But what my fear would be... Uh, is that this one was set in the past, and even though it was, had a very nice tone to it, the environment in which the whole story took place in that in that early 1900s universe, yeah, where that took place, just blended so well with what made this movie so special. The cultural environment. Really, yeah. of where women were, but without denigrating them, it was a kind of women had a place. Yeah, but it wasn't. So absurd to where it's that standard we see a woman f- being just belittled at every point. It was just a strong woman. She'd character. walk into a room and everyone would kind of do a double take and be like, oh, what, what's a girl doing here? Yes. You know, it's just kind of how, how the culture was back then. And Which they, they did not um, cease to remind us that. No, and, and it was very successfully yeah. shown throughout the entire film. But in any future movies, they're not going to have that. They it's going to be only more and more of a challenge. You think that might take away some of the charm when you don't have that kind of uphill battle the, against societal um, yeah. prog- or, uh, societal um, rules and stuff? You're, it's going to not that. be as organic a culture yeah. feel. Just in the, you're going to have to create. I feel, and that's kind of what everybody else has fallen into. And whenever they try and attempt to make these kinds of movies, yeah, is that they're stuck. Making such an anti-right person, such an anti-against-the-norm, let's say a, a, a sexist general or somebody who, who is keeping, yeah. you know, and think Jane uh, or Jane Doe or G.I. Jane or something where it's she's fighting against such un- overwhelming sexist odds that it's that's the theme of the movie as opposed to a, just a strong, independent woman that 
it's going to be hard to organically re- recreate mm-hmm. that entire feeling that came so naturally within the film. And it just rang true without being blunt and just hitting you over the head with that, that theme of, of powerhood, empowerment. Yeah. And all those, those things that is probably true to the idealism of feminism. Now, let's, go, let's dive a little bit deeper into the movie. Yeah. I thought that they played around with colors very well in this film. And in the beginning, when we're setting the tone inside this tropical island, really, it, it has that entirely lush green the, feeling. The water definitely pops off the screen. Um, whereas the other, the, the older, not older, but the, the last few DC films were super dark. And kind of hazy, yeah, you know, and a, like an it was yeah. You couldn't and... see what was going on. It was like very deep grays and blues and silvers. Really, like try to go for this gritty look, but it did not go over very well. This this film pops off the screen, and in a much better. I mean, it's a little bit much, I think, but it, it's so much better. But it transitions. It successfully transitions yeah. from that lush green opening, that wildlife. Uh, place that we start off with, with Gal Gadot, uh, Robin Wright, uh, Chris Pine, and a, a bunch of other characters who the are The island of the, the Amazons. Beginning. I forget what it was called, but yes. beautiful little island. Yes. And, and we have that entire place to bring upon. But once they leave that island, and again, just spoiler alert for that, they leave the island. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh no, Wonder Woman goes on an adventure. You never knew. You never would have guessed. They venture forth into dark, gritty London. And but but even then, like th- those visuals, kind of reminded me of like Sherlock Holmes, maybe Sherlock the, the Holmes, new ones. and then the whole uh, uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Yes, like very kind of cartoony looking visuals, but still like dark and and, and gritty and like old like industrial age London. I, I it got works. very much had that feel of of a DC comic where they're much darker comics. I had that atmosphere, but it wasn't as. It, it, it Annoyingly was, dark and stupidly yeah, or gritty. Again, being you know? blunt to the to a yeah. fault. And I really wanted to ask you because it's apparent from the beginning that all the other actresses in the Amazon, at least in that Amazonian uh, beginning that we see, to me it was interesting to see that they all adopted Gal Gadot's accent, and I thought that that was an interesting choice to have. The ensemble adapt to the main character as opposed instead of like the uh, them, them all agreeing on a, let's say a French accent or yeah. uh, an African accent whatever it may be them all conforming to something. The rest of the is actresses, that I, I didn't know that 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 was her actual accent. I I, I know that she is Israeli, so she, have she you is, have you ever seen her? In, oh well, you haven't seen Fast and the Furious. I've actually I actually went uh, for research watched that. Uh, a few of the scenes with her in Fast and Furious okay. as well. Yes. And I've seen her speak in interviews. So yeah, I, I guess she's got like kind of like an Eastern European, like like Israeli type accent. Right. And and so therefore, yeah, I guess they gave... I, I thought it was interesting too. I was going to say, is, do you have any problem with that? With the director just... I don't have a problem know, with it. Everybody else conformed to her. That, that goes um, on, on a bigger problem that I had with this film, which was just plot inconsistencies of like, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Why is that happening? And that was one of the things I was thinking about is why does everyone sound like they're from um, uh, Slovenia? I don't... <laughs> these are Amazons and they speak like a hundred languages, but that's the accent that they landed that's on. That's true. Which is all- weird. And, 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 and then if, if there's ever a film that you could get away with every single one of them talking a different language or having different accents even, it would probably be, be this film yeah. where they all spoke multiple But languages. then th- it's obviously a very di- diverse group of Amazons. And so th- they're called Amazons. And so I assumed that they were somewhere like in South America. That's like what it looked like. And maybe they would have more of a... Uh, Central American accent? I don't know. Central America. <laughs> not, it's, it's probably not Central Europe. Yeah, I, I don't Central know. a Latin accent Latin would be accent. what it is. And okay. or even a French well, accent. Well, because I assume where you go. Once you get be Portuguese. Portuguese, yeah, like once you get into like Brazil, like they have their own dialect and everything. Right. I, I I assume it'll be something along those lines. Not I mean and I I'm not like upset about it, but I was just that, oh, no, it's clearly effective, and yeah. it gives that uniformity of they're all in the same it's place. It's a weird choice. But it's it's an interesting choice when you have somebody like Robin Wright just speaking in that accent with the yeah. same 
ferocity as Gal Gadot. As Gal Gadot, yeah. I mean, and, and you're like, okay, you're just... I mean, she pulls it... Gal, by the way, Robin Wright in this film is fantastic. Yeah, she's, a, she's got like 20 minutes of screen time, but she does a great job, for no, sure. She, she plays a beautiful Amazon queen. She does excellent. She's fierce as heck. She... Her fighting was not... I couldn't... I was not bored by it. By one yeah. bit. I, it, I, I can only imagine... As a, as a, maybe like my sister, my younger sister, or some other young girl having that ambition to get up and fight. Because I, I as myself, was truly inspired to like get up and just punch like my bag of popcorn. I wanted to go like learn some <laughs> gymnastics after seeing these people like jump and do triple flips with shooting four arrows at once into these Nazi soldiers. It was, it was, it was pretty cool. I, I have a, a problem with, with DC's action sequences if we're going to get into it, but it was still uh, watchable. Going to your point of plot holes. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just speak to what can be found in, in the beginning of the film because I really don't want to ruin the ending because it has actually a very genuinely good ending. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. I won't even say if it's a surprise ending, if it's a scary ending. I'll fight you a- on that ending, though. The third act was my least favorite. Really? Really. Okay, okay. That's... Second act was my favorite. Third act I thought was lame. Did okay. not like it. Well, let's, let's just go... The first act for me was yeah. very annoying. And, and annoying? Reason, it was increasingly annoying. And I'll tell you the simple reason why. Gal Gadot was not told a darn thing, not just because of plot convenience, in, in the sense of not letting us know something for future reference, but because it would lead Ares to her. In this in this film, the entire plot is yeah. Wonder Woman has to kill Ares, or she's led on this mission to yeah. believe that she should kill Ares. Basically, and- like World War One is being caused by the fact that Ares has influenced humanity and is causing them to fight each other. So Wonder Woman believes she, she believes that if she goes to f- to find Ares, who's like a mythical creature, and if she kills him, war will be ended a forever. Mythical god. Yes, God. I'm sorry. No, no, I just that's a a Greek god. god. Mythical creature would be Pegasus. Well, thank you, Phil. I just wanted. It I to apologize be clear for to our listeners in the Greek <laughs> islands listening to us that yeah. they are not influenced by. To the citizens you, of Athens, I sincerely hope that you don't think that I'm I'm insulting your ancient gods. I I love Greek mythology, and I will be Were taking any of them played by Chris Pratt because you would hate them. Then. <laughs> Forget Zeus. <laughs> Zeus is gone. Oh my! Chris God. Pratt played him in a high Chris school Pratt's play. Chris Pratt's fine. He's just fine. He's an absolutely he fine 12, actor. And no longer is on Gary's. Somebody give Chris Pratt an Oscar so we can stop having this conversation already. <laughs> All right, but my point is, is that the entire beginning is justified by a mystery surrounding the fact that she cannot be told of her origins. Or really given any answers that they constantly bring up, which are unnecessary. Yeah. And the only answer we receive in response to that is, No, we cannot tell you because Ares will find her. Ares will kill her. Must- Ares, and it's just every single point was used with that exact excuse. And after a while, I was... I was Truly annoyed by how convenient that was, or in our uh, viewing audience. You have a question? No, Aries. Aries can't do it. Sorry. Go to the back of the DMV. (laughs) It was ridiculous. And and, uh, a little fun fact for you. Gal Gadot was five months pregnant during the filming of this uh, entire... Well, not during the entire film. She had a little mini Wonder Woman inside her the whole time? Yes. What? It has been said that she is indeed a Wonder Woman for being pregnant while filming. Wow. Apparently. Fun fact. Yes. That's... I I, I, want to know how many of... I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but... That's okay. is, Is that more impressive? Filming an entire film with action sequences and whatnot than Serena Williams playing through a couple tennis matches being, I believe, like three months pregnant. Um, I'm going to give it to Serena Williams just because DC has a CGI overload, and I can guarantee 80% of the shots were digital, so I don't know how much she actually had to do. Not trying to take it away, because being five months five months pregnant doing anything probably sucks. I work with a girl who's, who left when she was like eight months pregnant, and I mean, that was, I mean, she had a hard time just making coffee, so like, <laughs> fi- filming, <laughs> filming a major motion picture, doing those hours, putting in the work and stuff, hats off to you. 
but you, you so know, Serena I, takes I see, the cake on this one. I see peeking in the back production window back here. My girlfriend Ruby has has a comment. Ruby, do you want to come on in and uh, and give Gary? You you seem like you have a comment to say. She's gonna she's gonna give me I the know, skinny she's, on she's this. She's doing jumping jacks. About- I love Gal Gadot. I swear. I'm just I have to give it to Serena. I'm sorry. As a, as a quick aside, he hates Chris Pratt and oh my now god. Gal Gadot. <laughs> But anyways, where do you stand on the where do you stand on the Gal Gadot, Serena Williams, Ruby? Why why don't you have a baby, and let me know how you feel five months pregnant? Go do some jumping jacks five months pregnant. I don't know what to say right now. I'm speechless. She is a wonder woman. So is Serena. They're both wondrous women. I love them both. A what three hour tennis match filming for months. I am he is speechless. I am <laughs> this is your true test, sir. Do you give in to public pressure or do you hold still on your convictions? <sighs> I, I respect Serena. We Williams. need we need to see how many of these shots her stunt person did because you gotta admit a lot of this was digital effects. So did she I mean, she wasn't like doing stunts or anything. That's true. She was filming something along the lines of Fast and the Furious and she's like taking blows by a like, car. Like you know? riding a riding that's, a sport I, I, bike. Yeah, I will say that that's harder than, you know, you know, running across the court theoretically, I could imagine. Hey, all I'm gonna say is I'm sure that if I was five days pregnant, I would be the biggest baby about it and I couldn't do anything. You so, are what you eat. Well how about let's agree <laughs> not to compare two very Awesome women. Hey, th- that was this guy's hot take question. I was just... I mean, I'm probing... He, he was trying to get something out of me and trying to get something out of you. Do you notice He's that Aries. Not answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he got nothing to say. You are Aries. You are trying to create a war here. Now, I just want to go and uh, grab the little clip of you saying I love both of these women and show it to your girlfriend and see how she responds in turn. I you think that another... she she is more in love with Gal Gadot now than oh, really? she is with me. Yeah. And that's and and th- I think I speak all right. for a lot of women. And saying, saying that. that that is true. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for your input, Ruby. You can go back to uh, productions and go and grab your goodie bag. Thank you for coming in today for your chopped greens. We'll see you in a little the, bit. The the secretary will <laughs> show you out of the studio. Yes, yes. Edgar. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, all right. Let's get back on track. But where where where, where are we? Where, where, where are, are we? we? Where, where, where we want to be? We amen to that. Yes, we are. And do you know where we want to be? Where's that? We want to be talking about the pacing of this movie because even though it's two and a half hours, it did not feel like no, two and a half hours. Did not. Talk a, to a me very about the pacing. a very discernible first, second, and third act. The third act was weak because it fell into the same DC trap of a crazy, dumb CGI cluster fight of madness. But. Granted, it was very well paced. The second act, I thought, was the most enjoyable, was the most genuine, had the most heart. I thought that some of that heart was taken away by the trying to fit in as many big set pieces as we could in the third and final fight. That's my gripe with DC. I think that it looks really video gamey, and I've never been a fan of that. Mm, so when yeah. you get too into that, it's yeah, like that I can't even gripe. watch it. That is your gripe. That's, is. That, for you, that is my child actor gripe. Yes, th- yeah. the video game CGI, I just can't watch it. I don't have it, as much of a but, problem with it. Maybe it's because I am a video gamer yeah. and I, I enjoy, like I'm used to it, so it's like a comfortability thing. Going to your pacing point, I thought that each tone was perfectly placed and timed. So that way you felt different emotions, not to be played with, but different emotions that by the time you were just about spent with, oh, this is, uh, and I'm done being funny. Oh, it's a love story, and I'm done being romantic. And yeah. it's an action story, and it's a slow-mo, and it's a... Oh, it's fantastic. You know, each moment held its own, yeah. and so that way it was perfectly paced, much yeah. to your point, to where each emotion got its own specific, uh, almost scene, where, you know, on one, one spot they're in the boat, and it's funny. And and it's hard when you're just she she and Chris Pine the Caribbean couldn't make it funny when they're on a boat. Yeah, and Wonder Woman achieved that. I think that also Chris Pine and Gal Gadot had like terrific chemistry. They were just bouncing off each other so well. Well, in, the in fact those is that Chris Pine did not have a British accent, so that kind of took it all away for me. Really, I I, I think that his his kind of boyish American charmy accent works pretty well. Not if you're you know? supposed to be British. <laughs> I thought that he was just like a freelance mercenary working for the British. You can't, can you be a freelance spy? Yeah, of course you can. 
Under How much th- spying have you done? I've seen every single James Bond, and I've never seen him coerce with the well, American. Well, because he's James American. Bond, he's supposed to be British. Jason Bourne what? was just trying to survive. He was never working with the Russians or working with the Scandinavians. You know what? I did not have a gripe with his American accent because I thought it was cute and it worked. Just like his face is cute and he worked. Yeah. Great with Gal Gadot. Well, I'm glad that we found finally found a Chris P that you liked. <laughs> Sorry, Chris Pratt. We've uh, run out of Chris P. Chris so Pratt like- would have been terrible in this movie. Chris Pine was a great choice. How dare you, sir? <laughs> All right. One last section to really talk about that. Someone went in a good way unnoticed. The props, like the items. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you. Yes, let me mm-hmm. tell you. It takes a very special. And I mean this in the gen- most genuine way and fashion that I can talk about it. It takes a very special director, very special story, very special person to make the lasso of truth not be a stupid yeah. joke. <laughs> the lasso of truth is epic. It works. It, for I the love the lasso of truth. In all of Wonder Woman history, it is not a hokey side <laughs> throw. It's not... I'm so glad that they don't have the invisible car because that's going to yeah, be a hard oh, sell. No. I mean, Spongebob has the best <laughs> invisible car out there. Wonder Woman was a joke and a setup for Spongebob. But the lasso of truth. I compel you to tell the truth. Ooh. And, and, and maybe Ooh. it's partly Chris Pine selling it so well. Yeah, I mean. But I, the lasso of truth, that, that alone, the, I, I was amazed that they could make something so... Trivial outside of maybe Captain America's shield, but even then, yeah. it's still it's it's cool because it's a weapon of sorts, yeah. right? You can toss it, you can use it as a frisbee. It's multiverse. The lasso of truth. literally the lasso. Just just say that to yourself. Like I will wield the that lasso is, of truth. That's that just is, a cheesy it's, sentence it's right an there. Exact, it's a horribly aged item. Yeah, where it's a throw in from the eighties. Yeah, where everybody had to have a hokey thing like the the belt of justice, the sword know? of righteousness, the lasso of truth, the fire of burning, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, crown be... of telepathy, boots of bonjour. Ooh, yeah. We. Oui. Anyways, the point is, is that unlike something along the lines of Beauty and the Beast, where they have uh, teacups and yeah. uh, and dressers and candles and everything just blends well together. I, I've never seen items so well used. Even like Batman, they don't, they aren't as pronounced and key to the story. Yeah, as as anybody who reads the comment comics knows, they are to be. Uh, this is the first time I've ever seen a pivotal item that has such a hokey name and such a hokey purpose. Be freaking awesome. Be freaking awesome. <laughs> so go you. I mean, she, she was interrogating with it. She was fighting people with it. She was like swinging across like buildings and stuff with it. I, the lasso of truth is like her greatest weapon. It's pretty cool. And to wrap up uh, Wonder Woman and partly why I think it was such an interesting film, not just in that it was a good film. That's a standalone statement. Mm-hmm. What it entailed as far as being a big box office blockbuster Mm -hmm. and being able to do that with such a wide variety of ethnicities and genders, Mm -hmm. to me, it really showcased that multiculturalism, uh, that acceptance that's really going on right now. But it didn't do it in a, a PSA sort of public announcement of like, Hey, come see the new, you know, movie that's all about human rights and everything. It, yeah. In in society, we the best way that you can fight oppression or fight against a lot of these isms like sexism, you know, racism, what have you. The way that you can truly fight them is by treating people fairly. Just if you're going to fight if you would fire a man over the same thing a woman did, it's okay to fire her if if that's what you would do in any case. It's not against any one person. So when I say that they just accepted everybody in their role, when there's um, an Indian chief, when there's an, uh, a person of Indian descent in the film, and then a woman headlining the whole thing, mm-hmm. just to name a few of the of The, the female exam- director, too, which is female a really, director, really yes. big deal, too. When they're able to do that and they don't pronounce it, it's not exactly... Uh, a, a bit like that's not the draw. The fact that that's happened, it's just it's just uh, is what it is. Shows you how strong of a message it is just by simply being. Yeah, I 
I want to end by saying um, I have two siblings. Both are my sisters. They are 10 and 8. They love action movies. Mm-hmm. I have gotten them into it. They love Star Wars. They love the Marvel Universe. They love Guardians of the Galaxy. They love all that stuff. But 99.9% of the scenes and the characters in that movie are very male-centric. Most female characters are either plot um, uh, conveyors, um, objects of romantic interest, or just gen- generally like throwaway characters. The only two exceptions were Star Wars The Force Awakens and Wonder Woman. And you know, there is now a generation where their first superhero and first Jedi yeah, are, are girls. Are women. And I, I think uh, for them, I guess it was it was weird for me at first because I'm so used to seeing men like beat up other men on screen that I was, I'm just used to it. But for them, seeing Wonder Woman charge through a trench and use a shield and just beat up 20 guys and straight up tell a man, I don't need you to tell me what to do because I can come up with the uh, decisions for myself. Um, I think that that's really, really, really important. And it was directed by a woman. Um, She wasn't sexualized at all. She was just fierce and kick ass. Exuded confidence. Yeah. And so... um, I, I think that just I mean, men have had that forever in movies and women have never had that. There's always been an asterisk like, oh, Black Widow beats people up, but then she falls victim to the seduction of three of the Marvel superheroes and she wears a tight leather suit, you know? Mm-hmm. So this is the first one I felt that didn't have an asterisk on it. It was just a cool female character, which I think is so important. So hopefully movies will start to build on that. And All so right. I was very excited about that. Are you ready with your Rotten Tomatoes score? Yes. Who's going to go first? I'll have you go first. I want to say Rotten Tomatoes. I want to say out of 100. Okay. I want, I want yeah, to break this away say, from the Rotten Tomatoes. Let's separate ourselves. Okay. Yeah. Let's separate. I agree. From my, on. my score out of 100 for this movie was a 71. I have a 7 in mine as well. Really? Yeah. You, but you but didn't. Go ahead. Explain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, if, if it was the same thing but not Wonder Woman... I would probably rate it as like a 55 or a 60, but because of the culture implications th- that I just kind of went on a tangent about, I think it elevates it. It was genuinely fun to watch. It's not the best superhero movie. It's the best DC Extended Universe movie. Um, nothing too crazy about it, but just a, a fun, in- entertaining, and important watch. Precisely. Go and that's it. exactly... For those reasons alone, it's very important in film history, but I've got to give it a 17 just kidding. Oh my I, god. I just wanted to see. I just wanted to see. Are you serious? No, no, I'm not. I'm not. It's Phil, an eight. <laughs> we need to turn it off. <laughs> I just wanted to see, I just wanted one last kick oh. in for my kicking and screaming for making for you making me go see this film. But it really was You a enjoyed gen- it. It was you a like genuine it. joy. Yeah. Seeing Robin Wright again. Jedi. I have like a, a dignified woman crush for Robin Wright. Like, she's killing it, man. She is fantastic. Wow. Anytime I see her in House of Cards, she's fantastic. But my true rating out of a uh, hundred has got to be eighty-three. There's no seven in that. No, I know, but I was lying and saying the <laughs> seven. <laughs> okay, a- eighty-three. Okay. I lied, Gary. I'm t- I was telling you the truth when I said I lied. If we're going out of a hundred, you you liked it more than I did. I did, and wow. well, but I enjoyed the third act more than you. Yeah, did. the third act was dumb. I'm sorry, guys. Wow. And I <laughs> I truly enjoyed the ending. And um, really, I, I it's not one of those films that I would want to see over and over again. It, it was monumental, and I'll remember most of it, and I'll be able to conjure up uh-huh. feelings. And for the next one, I'll, I won't need to go and watch it again, yeah. uh, nor will I want to. But um, I feel like that's reserved for 90 and up for me personally. Because uh, it takes a lot for me to go see a movie. But yeah. Uh, 83, great film, great uh, trailblazing film, just in genre, just yeah. in cultural implications. Much like the Avengers, not with the cultural side, but it was a groundbreaking film. Ground, you've and, never and seen anything like that before. Never seen anything and something successfully doing it, too. Yeah. You might have seen glimpses of it here and there, but nothing being successful. Yeah. So I'm going to give it an 83. Nice. You and know, good luck, Wonder Woman 2. Don't know that you can yeah. be beat that, but you good know, job. Y- you say you wouldn't go like out of your way to watch it over and over again. Neither would I, because it's it's on that level of just like an average superhero movie. But I can almost guarantee my ten and eight year old sisters are gonna get a DVD. Oh yeah, and they are gonna watch it 
over and over again because it's, it's such a big deal. So, like, this, this I might, would understand if you wanted to watch it over and over again because I've never seen anything like it this before. This could be the cultural equivalent to Star Wars for boys in the 80s. Yeah. Just where it was such a, a, a switch that it drove boys to an all-new genre that was reserved for a small niche group and yeah. then it just widespread and stuck to something. And while we've kind of... Boys have been, you know, assimilated with... Uh, superheroes and yeah. the, that genre. Now we can get, and hopefully, women join the group. Yeah. We have a whole group of, of, I mean, of multi acceptance in the Geek Squad. You can you can throw aside all of like where you side. Everybody's welcome to the Geek Squad. Like if 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 you throw aside all of of of, of your social stances on on feminism, the first two DC movies, which were all about men and directed by men, sucked. This was all about women and was directed by a woman, and it was pretty awesome. So if that doesn't tell you right there, I don't know what to say. Yes. All right. We will come back with an award-winning version of Give Me Five. Yes. And I... Five-time Emmy-nominated segment, Give Me Five. <laughs> nominated how many times have we won? Come back and check after the commercials. <laughs> Red Ribbon Realty Group at HomeSmart is a full-service real estate team of Phoenix natives with over 15 years of experience in the industry. When you work with them, you have two full-time realtors representing your best interests throughout your entire transaction, whether you are selling, buying, or renting. They also believe in supporting their community. Use code word chopped greens and Red Ribbon Realty Group will donate 15% of their net commission from your transaction to the nonprofit charity of your choice. Visit their website at www.redribbongroup.com and find them on Facebook. You can also email them at info at redribbongroup.com or call them at 602-888-6638. Red Ribbon Realty Group. Trust. Commitment. Home. Cavs in seven. That's my answer to how many Emmys we've won. It doesn't make any sense. Draymond sucks. Cavs in seven. LeBron has 20 rings. It'll never... LeBron has 20... That would take a lot. And I, I love LeBron myself, He'll but... play for 20 years. Imagine if he won a championship every... You know what? Golden State could win 20 rings if they Not if they don't win this one. Every year. <laughs> if the Cubs come back from 3 Which, by the way, we should mention we just finished watching the Cavaliers yeah. win game four... Let's yes. go! Just you like I what? predicted. I, Cavs in seven. So I predicted the Warriors to one and five, which I still think will happen. And I hate myself for this, but just seeing the Cavs pull out a good win has just sparked off one little inch of hope in the back of my mind. And I, I'm really trying to kill it, but it's like, but but what if they what, came back from 3-0? What, what, what if what if they won? Speaking of what if, what if Ruby came back because she hated her gift basket? Here she is! Oh my Welcome god! Welcome back for Gimme Five, Ruby. Hello! How'd you get back into the studio? And we have Edgar! Such a- Edgar! She's Edgar. with us! Edgar, more team, Edgar. <laughs> Alright. Here we go. This is Gimme Five, the part of the show where I've got five questions for you, Gary. You've got five questions for me. We don't know what they are, but we will answer them honestly. Would you like to go first, Gary? You know, I would. I would like to tell you about a very interesting piece of news that I heard about. There's a man in California who's just arrested for shooting another man with a shotgun shell that was filled with Rice Krispies. He shot him in the hand. That's kind of, that's the the equivalent of if a bear poops in the woods and nobody's around to smell it, did he really poop? How is that the equivalent of that? Because it, did he really shoot him if it's filled with Rice Krispies? Yeah, I'm assuming it'd be Rice Krispies snap, crackle, pop. Ow! He snap, crackle, <laughs> popped his collar. Yes. When he, and, and my, my question to you is uh, what uh, food contraption weapon would you make to use in an apocalyptic war against zombies? If you only had food at your disposal, would you make a, a Rice Krispies shotgun, a banana sword of justice, a hot dog spear? A potato. I was going to say, is is there any other answer than the potato bazooka? Okay, you guys came up with that too quick. Oh my god, the world is out of potatoes. We are in Ireland. No potatoes. What are you going to do? Well, you obviously... Get drunk. (laughs) (laughs) Using the potatoes that I no longer have a need for. (laughs) Uh, Get the zombies drunk. Okay. And then kill them. With? My super strength due to the drunkness. There you go. My answer is a little more. Potatoes. I'm gonna go <laughs> off the grid here. So, uh, what is the best camouflage in the world? World, corn stalks. Corn stalks. I'm gonna grow both corn stalks you in know a field. That takes a while to grow, right? 
I'm gonna have super corn stalks. <laughs> I'm gonna go where there's already corn. I'm gonna set up like a little tree in the middle of it so that way I can kind of see them coming. Gotcha. And then I'm gonna harvest all the corn, shave it off, whittle it down, and I'm just gonna like knife them. Just Ooh, little gonna, corn th gonna cor throwing corn yeah, ears. I'm gonna, no, yes, I'm gonna. Is that the yeah, yeah. No, that's yeah. That's the, that's like the banana peel of this. <laughs> I'm gonna cob them. Wow. Yeah, I'm gonna cob their salads. All right, here we go. Ruby and Gary, Taylor Swift is indeed coming back. Yes, not only with a new album, Witness, oh. which drops tomorrow, but yes. the pop star is making her triumphant return to Spotify. Yes! I was so happy about that. Yes, yeah, she pulled all her mu music in anticipation of her Grammy-grabbing album, 1989. Grammy-grabbing. Gra yes, yeah. I actually said that one. Can't citing one. reasons of what she called shocking and, quote, disappointing in regards to widespread music streaming services. However, today she has softened her stance, putting forth a release on her social media, saying, in honor of 1989 selling 10 million albums worldwide, Taylor wants to thank her fans by making her entire back catalog available to all streaming services tonight at midnight. Woo! Yeah, it's Taylor. In honor of T-Swizzle's return, guys, I must ask you, what are your top three Taylor Swift songs? First of all, that's like a not-so-humble humble brag, and I lost all respect for her. Like, <laughs> oh, on Taylor's part? Like a really long time ago, so... So that means that we're gonna go old school with Ruby. <laughs> Teardrops uh, on your guitar? No. I don't know. Gary, you go first. Alright, so I am an extremely, extremely casual Taylor Swift fan. I like her newer stuff. I don't like her more country stuff. Um, my top three, number three is Blank Space. I I can jam to that song. There's also a lot of good covers out there of that song, too, that are better than that. Oh, I'm sure they are. Yeah, There's some say, excellent you are covers. so hard. I like Blank Space. Number two is We Are Never Getting back together, we. Hey, I was like dumped by like the love of my 14 year old life or 16, whenever that came out, and that was like, that was like my I hate you song. I was like, we're never getting back together. Yeah, you're doing like. <laughs> yeah. cool. All right. And uh, number one is, uh, can you guess? I stay out too late. Down, 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 down. And nothing in my brain. Da, 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 da. But that's what people say. I think Ooh. I'm the only one annoyed by her newer stuff. It's it's so it's like know. it's such bubblegum pop and it's really it's that's disgusting. what it is. But it's so catchy. But it's disgusting. the players gonna play, 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 and the haters, haters gonna, gonna hate, 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 hate. What is your list? Uh, I don't know. I remember having her Speak Now album. I went to her Speak Now tour Whoa. when I liked her. Uh, she was a lot shorter in those days. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think, was it the Fearless album? Fearless. I think it was. It was, like, there were three songs on her deluxe album that were really good. All right, and so. I don't remember what they were called. Wow, they were nothing. Ex, they were so great that they are unforgettably forgettable. Except they're... <laughs> they're... They're not forgettable. Okay, it was uh, Jump, Then Fall, and then... So that's number three. I, I feel like Forever and Always is like... Everybody liked that song at some point. And then, so number one has to be Teardrops on My Guitar. No. Shake It Off. And do we have a tie for Shake It Off being number one? I actually hate Shake It Off. I knew you were trouble when you walked in. The goat Did ruined that song for me. The... Oh, no, my favorite one was called Enchanted. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. There we go. So Enchanted. congratulations, T-Swizzle, for selling 10 million. Uh, Gary. All right. Um, does this name ring a bell in your head at all? Sam Panopoulos. Oh, my gosh. Yes, it does. That's hilarious. Sam Panopoulos. Yes. All right. Yes, um, it does. But go ahead and tell the folks at home. So Sam Panopoulos is the legendary, yes, legendary Canadian man who invented... Hawaiian pizza. Yeah! I, I really, 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 really like Hawaiian pizza. All right. I am one of the weirdos. Like, I, I eat it with blue cheese. I think it's really good. He just died at age 83. <laughs> and Way to bring that back to earth. Yeah. I um, really, really enjoy Hawaiian pizza. And this guy died. died. Uh, he left a legacy that has delighted, confused, and appalled diners worldwide, often at the same time. Phil, I need your hot take. Okay. On the everlasting debate. Pineapple on pizza? Why or why not? 
No, it's, no. it's an atrocity to all mankind to have fresh fruit on a pizza than baked. It is disgusting. The flavors do not matter. But you're down with like a butchered pig on there and processed anim- living thing, okay, not a pineapple? But to be fair, his taste is limited to mac and cheese and quesadillas. Oh, you're one of those like four year olds. Yes. Do you willingly eat cheese pizza? I willingly eat that dino nuggets and cheese pizza. pizza. Cheese oh, pizza. cheese pizza? Phil! A- hey, whoa, 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 guys. It's four cheese pizza. <laughs> <laughs> None of which can be. Pineapple mo- is delicious on pizza. Yeah. That was a high five because we like pineapple on pizza. It's amazing, and people who don't like it obviously. Have some weird thing where they eat cheese pizza, which is just a, a, a breadstick with some cheese on it. You, you need to throw it's some culture stick. in your life, man. He just doesn't like flavor, you know. I I guess I don't, but he doesn't want to party. You know, it's funny. Yeah. My but girlfriend you know Maddie is I, like that too. She yeah. likes mac and cheese, chicken nuggets, white bread, all that good stuff. All that the basic no flavor. The basic see, American kid see, diet. She's yeah. Fight, yeah. See, she's fighting for pineapple and fresh fruit on pizza everywhere. But yeah, you put peas on that pizza, she is outie. Who put peas? Because well, that's just, that's like satanic. No one would do that. Thank you. Peas? Would, that, that's not even an argument, dude. That's just, that's, don't lump us in with that group of demonic folk. Okay? We're not like that. Yeah. We're smart. All right. Well, since you stole my question, I am coming up with one on the fly. Oh, I am yeah. so sorry. See, this is why this is honest and yes, real time. It's true. Or like a well oiled machine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Gary, Tom Hardy wrote a touching tribute after his dog passed away. Yes. The actor's devoted canine, Woody, reportedly died a few days ago at six years old due to a long battle with poly, uh, polymyositis. Woody was known for joining Hardy on movie sets and red carpets. The tribute is as follows. I love you beyond words, to the moon and back again and again to infinity beyond. Woody was an angel and he was my best friend. We went through so much together. He was special, bro, a shining example of man's best friend. He burnt very, very bright, and those that burn very bright sometimes burn half as long. Yeah. Jeez. This is all to say, Gary, if you could have a, any animal as a pet, which animal outside of the regular cat dog would you go? What kind of segue is that, man? I'm so sad <laughs> right now. <laughs> I just Jeez. got a dog, and like, I can't even Well, uh, Tom Hardy, I, I really like you. I think you're like one of the most... Talented actors. Look at this. I'm really this is sorry. The video that oh, we got a video. Oh, <laughs> the dog loves him so much. Look at how he looks at him. Yeah. Oh, he's his dad. Now, now Woody's no longer got a buzz. All right. If I was, I, that, was that too soon? I just like a good pun. I'm sorry. All right. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> if I could have one pet as an animal, that's not a, that's not a conventional pet. So, all right. So growing up, I had a stepbrother who had a snake, and he forced me to like feed like little mice to it, and I about cried. And he told me that it was gonna crawl up my pants when I was asleep. He was gonna <laughs> let it out. I hated that thing, so I don't like exotic pets because they scare me. But if we're gonna go just crazy left field here, I would and it probably won't eat you. It won't yeah, eat whatever it is, it's not. If it's a rhino, you're not gonna wake up with a rhino horn in your. I would uh, love to live with. Well, so my two favorite animals are a bear and a gorilla. Ooh. And I would love to probably have... Actually, you know what? Let's say a chimpanzee. Okay. I would love to just live with, like, a, the most intelligent of animals, but still only, like, 2% as intelligent as us. Like, just a cool little buddy who could, like, swing around my house and, like, eat very, apples and hang out. Very smart choice by you. I was thinking you were going to go with gorilla, and I was going to warn you that those gray back gorillas I'd be, are... Huge. I would be terrible. Like I, I would see him. You like, would not want to get into an argument with that girl. No. Like that- imagine like 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 arguing with him about like household chore duties. If like he, if he wants a hey bed. Chad, why haven't you done the dishes? <laughs> like, <come> yeah. He's <laughs> <laughs> talking to this animal. Which one? And the animal's understanding you. Yeah. They okay. Really? Have you heard of Coco the gorilla? She speaks sign language. She's smart as heck. <gasps> no, there's a lot. There's yeah, plenty of cases with gorillas who can actually communicate through sign yeah, language. That's cool. They're very smart. Very smart. Yeah. Animals. I would love to hang right. out with a uh, mammal. A yeah. very smart mammal, not just a regular mammal. All right. Very good. Your turn. Let's see here. Gary. All right. So uh, through these finals uh, and through the past few years, we've 
discovered that Rihanna has a giant yeah. crush on LeBron. She is like LeBron, LeBron James. She's like his number one celebrity fan, which is totally cool. And Riri. I, I love that LeBron is like a family man, and he's married to his high school sweetheart. But imagine the power couple that would happen if he and Rihanna were a thing. That kid would work, 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 work. <laughs> so I, I just want to ask you, like, what celebrity? Now we are, we have. Ruby, the amazing girlfriend here, so, yes, you, I mean, you better watch your words. Of course. But what celebrity would you want rooting for you on the sidelines if you were a professional athlete? What celebrity would I want? You know what? <laughs> that was the answer. Okay, okay, okay let me, let's see. Let me, let me think here. Okay, if I could have a celebrity... <laughs> oh, man, Gary, this is funny. Uh, which celebrity would I want to cheer me on? Uh, you know what? Actually, let's let's go off the grid because if I were to go on because the, the answer is too obvious. The answer is too obvious. Okay, no, but if I could go on the grid, I think it would probably be The Rock. How cool! He'd be such a cool hype man. Yeah. Couldn't you he'd imagine him actually being really cool be and just like you'd like look over as you're like jogging across court and he's there like in a cheerleader outfit. He's like, yeah, Phil. Yeah. Yeah, go! And he's just like buff. And, and, and if anybody tried to talk to you in like a mean way, I, I would feel secure that yeah. I'd be like, hey, the, the Rock would take care of business. Yeah. And then now I have to ask you guys on three, I want you to say the answer because now that, I just want to know. Right. I want to see if you guys say the same okay. thing. There's One, no. two, three. Ariana Grande. What? Yeah. <laughs> wow, I did not know that. that we we both right. have our celebrity crushes. And, and she's yours. And she's mine for some reason. Huh. She's just misunderstood, Gary. Yeah. All right. Wow. For the past four years, a man named Ted, and this is for both you, Ruby, and you, Gary, All right. attended Hilarity for Charity events where he takes a picture with comedian Seth Rogen. The best part is that the two have somewhat of a meta tradition surrounding the picture. Rogen always holds the photo from the previous year in one hand while giving a thumbs up with the other. Hilarity for Charity is a nonprofit started by Seth Rogen and his wife, Lauren Miller Rogen, that, quote, aims to significantly improve outcomes for all family members contending with Alzheimer's disease by 2020, end quote. Ted, who prefers to keep his last name private, has helped fundraise for HFC since he was a freshman at the University of Vermont. His annual photo is certainly a creative way to bring attention to the event. Gary, I give you a chance to take a selfie and you, Ruby, with any person in the world. Who do you choose and why? Because it's a very interesting question of you just get a picture with them. So you don't, you could theoretically say, I want to take a selfie with the Pope. And that would be something significant since yeah. the Pope doesn't take, you know, doesn't go on the internet, doesn't take photos. Or do you go kind of, you know, off the grid, Edward Snowden, or maybe like Tupac if you think he's somewhere. Ooh. Where do you guys go? Interesting. I go, I go one of two ways. All right. All right. I'm imagining right. it's somewhere. Is it one of them political? Yeah. Yeah, I figured as much. See, this is yeah. this is one of those. Okay, so go ahead, uh, Ruby. Okay, I have two. Can I give my two answers? Sure. Go ahead. Which venue are you going with? Uh, can I go with both? Yeah. Go ahead. Just name. Chris Evans. Uh, oh yeah. yeah that's, that's her Ariana Grande. Oh heck yeah. That's Captain America. Yes. <laughs> or the Obamas. <gasps> yeah. Michelle, you Michelle you Barack. stole. I was gonna say Barack Obama for mine. They're um, incredible. I, I I don't know. I think uh, he is such a cool guy, and I would I, yeah. I'd love to have a selfie with him. But if we're just gonna go like for fun, it would be Matt Damon. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I'd love to bad. have. A, he's like my favorite actor. So. No, See, I, I was. I fangirled over a moment. I had a piece of paper in my in front of me that was signed by Barack Obama. Oh. I almost cried. I really did. My gosh, I I saw him speak at ASU in 2008, and I didn't get how oh. significant it was. So I was like, uh, can we go? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I wish that I really would have paid attention. Like ah, <laughs> 12 year old Gary, you suck. <laughs> All right, go ahead, uh, 21-year-old Gary. All right, 21-year-old Gary has this question about stupid people. Oh, so, Blunt's gazing. Blunt's gazing coming in. So uh, Derek Fisher, the coach of the Knicks, oh. was <laughs> just arrested <laughs> for a DUI. This is like two weeks after Tiger Woods was arrested for a DUI. I don't know if you've seen the video. Well, to be, the, just as a nuanced uh, thing, Tiger, Tiger Woods said did, he didn't know because it was zero point prescription zero drugs. Yeah, prescription drugs. But anyways. I'm assuming you've seen the video of Patrick Peterson getting arrested 
for having a DUI when he was asleep at a stoplight. No, not Patrick Peterson. It was, oh, no, no, no. Oh, my bad. It was... Um, Notre Dame. Michael, Michael Floyd. Mi- Michael Floyd. Yes, yes. I'm so sorry. Not, not, not Patrick Peterson. No, no. Michael Floyd. Model citizen. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and just like my big question, I don't, I don't get it, so maybe you can help me out, but <laughs> why don't rich people use Uber? What, if you, like, you have the money... Why don't you like like okay. you know you're gonna okay. go out and get slammed? Right. Why do you drive home? You have like twenty million dollars yes, in the bank. Yes, what okay. are you doing? That's not the issue here. What's then? the issue? So you've got to ask yourself what's what is the issue? The issue is for one, if you bring your car to a, a club or somewhere else, the number one issue is you don't want to leave it there. It's just that it's that idea of whatever it is of not wanting to leave your car there. Why they don't ask their so owners, dumb. the rich owners who and GMs who I'm, I've I've been assured all have people who would gladly escort them and drive them yeah. and usher them around uh, I don't know why they don't take advantage of that. I would but, say have some foresight. Drive there get, or but, get driven there, get the, driven home. But honestly, Gary, the, the obvious answer here is that when you're drunk, you make very bad decisions. You're, you're yeah. already not in a logical thinking but sense. But you're choosing to take your car when you're not drunk. If, if you know, hey, I'm gonna go out tonight, I'm gonna hit up the clubs of Scottsdale AZ, like, why don't you just get a chauffeur? So, Costs like what twenty bucks for the ride? Like, come on. Yeah, it, it it's it's true. it's true, and it, I'm not I'm by no means. I think I think one and you're well, done. To be honest that, with there's you. There's also that mentality. Well, I'm so rich, I don't give a, you know. No, yeah. some some there are cases of entitlement. I don't think to generalize that it's fair. I mean, yeah, they're not. But all. but. And again, like I said, one and done for me. A DUI, I I don't I don't have any uh, leeway there. You, I, yeah. I think that you're endangering not just your life but the lives of others. Yeah. And there have been cases of football players that were doing D or had a DUI at around like 7 a.m. and that's when children go to school yeah. and everything and that's no longer. So I, that that's not to say that, but what but I am just going to say that and the explanation is that you just don't make smart decisions when you're drunk. And even though yes, you should be able to foresee it, uh, there situations arise where you go out to drink and you drink too many and it's right after a winning game or I don't know what it is, but the the, the answer is you you make you bad make stupid decisions, decisions when yeah. when you're drunk. Yes. So don't drink and drive, people. Don't be stupid like Derek Fisher and Michael Floyd. All right, Gary. Last week, Bill Maher did a very bad thing during an exchange with Senator she Ben did Sass, do a terrible the Republican thing, Republican from Nebraska, on his show Real Time. The political satirist uh, casually dropped the N-word, responding to a silly dig by Sass. Uh, We'd love to have you work in the fields with us, he joked. Mar quipped, work in the fields, Senator I'm a house, N-word. The backlash was appropriately swift, with Black Lives Matter activist DeRay uh, McKesson and uh, MC activist Chance the Rapper calling for a mayor to be kicked off the air. The comic, for his part, issued a rare apology, quote, Friday nights are always my worst nights of sleep because I'm up reflecting on the things I should or shouldn't have said on my live show, he wrote. Last night was a particularly long night as I regret the word I used in the banter of a live moment. The word was offensive and I regret saying it and I'm very sorry. End quote. On Friday night's edition of his HBO program Real Time, the real exchange occurred later in the program when the iconic rapper turned actor Ice Cube joined the program. The two had a lengthy discussion. It's kind of it's it's very interesting to read just the dialogue. Mm-hmm. But just uh, with Ice, uh, the main giveaway or takeaway was that's our word now, and you can't have it back. Gary, where do you fall in the use of that word, the N word, and should Mar have been fired? I I agree with Ice Cube, and it's something that I don't think you understand unless you're you're black, and I'm obviously not. And I I tried to empathize instead of because I I mean in general like it's, it's a very tough question. I, I, and, and it's in a, general, it's so yeah, I, layered. I it's. It's an empowering thing because it was a word that was used for degradation that is is now instilled like a sense of community and I get that I would never say it it's my, almost myself. A sense, it's a word of empowerment now to a certain group because yeah. you own that word now and where it used to bring you down now you're using it. Yeah, um, and it's that's the, it's that's I mean the obviously the, the English language changes and that word itself has has evolved. Um should Mar have been fired? I mean, we just saw Bill O'Reilly fired over yeah, other issues. This, 
It's so I I up until that happened, I was a big fan of him. I kind of liked how Bill Riley? Bill Bill Maher. Bill Maher. Okay. I I enjoyed how crass he was, but that was crossing the line. Um, he's not usually apologetic because he said some really messed up things about he's about Muslims. The, he's been fired in the past. Too. Yeah, from saying really bad things. Uh, I I actually went out and said that I wasn't going to watch another episode of his show. Um, I think he did apologize. It, he, too. he went out. I, th- I think he was sincere, and I think he just made a really stupid decision. I think he made a good choice by having Ice Cube on, like a very uh, oh, and influential he had Neil voice. Oh, Tyson on there. He yeah. did a whole episode just addressing the issue. I, I, th- I think yeah, I, I think it was cool. Like it. he brought people on who were just going to kind of tear him for it, which is good. I believe in second chances. So I think it's uh, hopefully he improves and goes forward. And I guess HBO made the right decision not to fire him, but he is on thin ice now. That's because I mean, and if if if, if you watch it, like it's d- disgusting how casually he says it, uh-huh. and and it makes me wonder if that's how he talks in his personal life because his reaction to that joke was like another joke with the N word, and I was like, is this how Bill Maher actually is? Because like that's not cool. Like I I don't joke like that, and I don't like people who. Who casually joke like that, you know, like like white people who do that. You know, this is the podcast to do it out of the two between uh, you with movies and Luke with sports. Mm-hmm. This is the one to do it because to me in my life, what has really impacted me a lot is movies. And one of the few movies that has really had a profound impact in my life was 12 Years a Slave. Mm. Just a incredible, I don't know in, in the long scheme of things how great of a standalone movie it is, but... So important. But it's incredibly important. And yeah. Not that I ever used the word before, but I didn't truly understand the importance and the history. Yeah. True, like, just the entire history of that word. Um, and I didn't use it just to just to be fair, and, and I, I felt no need to use it. So it never was bestowed upon me to use that word. But after seeing 12 Years a Slave, I, I just made a personal vow to never yeah, it's use not that a... word. It, it, the way that it's used, and the, and the with the harshness and the ugliness one of the one of the if not the ugliest words in the human language uh i just don't i don't think it's up for anybody outside the black community yeah and it's i i i I, i'm a huge fan of of rap music i love kendrick lamar i love kanye west i love chance the rapper yeah and but and so like and that's true whenever that whenever that word comes up and you know i i i i I skip it i mean even if i'm bumping it to like a really hard rap song i i choose not to say it even if everyone around me does just because like I don't think it's it's for me and like I said I think that's something like a lot of uh, people who who think the opposite of me criticize but they don't understand because maybe they haven't been stopped at a supermarket and called that by like Mm-hmm. An old angry white person. I, I have friends who are very dear to me who are black who've told me horror stories. I've seen it happen at my work. Mm-hmm. And so I just think you have to empathize, and that's where I stand on it. Very hard issue. A lot of thought, a lot of layers. Yeah. Your turn, Gary. Last well, question. <laughs> a little bit more lighthearted. Yes, yes. Let's get back to um, the- So we're just talking about uh, uh, game four of the NBA Finals. Yeah. This is an interesting question, I think. So Kevin Durant is obviously, I think, the best the best player on the Warriors. Oh, right? yes. yes he's, no he, question. He's the best player on the Warriors. Everyone knows that. But who is, like, the heart of the Warriors? Who is, is the glue? Because I, I would argue that it's Steph Curry. He's not the best player, but he is still the guy who you think of when you think Warriors. He's the guy who made them what they are. Or is or you might think it's Draymond Green because he's the X Factor. You might say it's Steve Kerr. Maybe you think for some reason it's Clay Thompson or... JaVale McGee or something. I, it, Me personally, it's Steph Curry, but I, I want to hear who you think is, is their soul of, of that organization. Right. Well, Mr. Rat tell himself JaVale McGee is not in the <laughs> heart of the Golden State Warriors. Yeah. Let's get that out of the way quick and foremost. Uh, Steph Curry. It's an, interesting, it's an interesting question. Great question. Because it's almost... Uh, by everybody it's been tossed around and it's so solidified with everybody that Draymond Green is the heart and soul of this team that it's kind of hard to bar away but if you bring some nuance and some insight into who really is the heart and soul of this team uh, you can make a very interesting case for Steph and Curry yeah Uh, I think what is uh, what what takes away from that is even though he brings a lot of that energy and that showcase 
ability that the Golden State Warriors are known for, and he brings that flash and sizzle. Uh, when they win the finals that first year, Stephen Curry didn't make a major impact. He didn't. And I would argue that Draymond Green was the reason why they won. Uh, more, of course, there's Andre Iguodala, but I, I, I would say Draymond drove them more than Steph Curry did not. Mm-hmm. And in slumps, it's not like they they can go without. And we've seen the effect of Draymond Green going out versus Stephen Curry going out. I would still stick with Draymond, but if you can make an interesting case that he yeah. leads by example, and then Draymond Green leads by words. And it just the, the pairing of the two really brings the whole team together. Yeah. So you have both sides of anybody in the, in the locker room who prefers a guy who's silent but deadly or loud and rambunctious. So yeah. it, either way, it... it I think it's for for each his own, but I'll stick with Draymond Green. All right. All right. Ruby and Gary. Uh, Brenna Porter, a sophomore track and field athlete at Brigham Young University, took this mantra to heart after a serious leg injury in the middle of the NCAA West Regionals. She tripped over her first uh, the first hurdle, fell on her head, and unbeknownst to her tore a seven-inch gash in her leg. Jesus. She rose to her feet and pressed on to the finish. Uh, Quote, I remember when I was coming around the fourth turn, my leg felt super wet. Porter said in a BYU video. Oh, my God. I was like, either I'm sweating really bad or it's bleeding really bad. And I just want to show you really fast a a picture. All right. No. Pull it up, pull it pull up. It up. No. It's coming up right here. Ruby already saw a little bit of yeah, it. Yeah, she is shying away right yeah. now. Let's see. Whoa! Oh yeah. my, her it, leg is like hanging off itself. The quad is, is or the calf, the is, calf kind is kind of oh my out there. God, that's disgusting. Yes. Wow. This is all to say, Gary, what is the worst injury you've ever had? And Ruby, you too, if you have a, have a bad injury story. Uh, I played basketball in high school, and like all basketball players, I was prone to ankle injuries. I had a really bad one one time. You're the Stephen Curry of North Point. Yeah, I was. <laughs> but So mine still like affects me. I'm, according to my medical practitioner, it will affect me for the rest of my life. Oh, God. M- my ankle is kind of tight right now, actually. Um, I blew, I by definition, I'm doing air quotes right now, blew out my ankle. Um, there's three major tendons in your ankle, I learned, <laughs> and... I had a third degree sprain on all three of them. A first degree sprain is when you pull the tendon too much. A second degree degree sprain is when you slightly tear it. A third degree is when you completely rupture the tendon. And I completely ruptured the three major tendons in my ankle. Um, I broke... uh, What were you doing? Just running around? I did a crossover and I tripped and I fell straight down on my left ankle. I broke uh, my growth plate in my foot and I broke uh, bones on both sides of my ankle so my ankle was just kaput no, after that I was going to say did you know like as soon as it was done that you it was were... like the worst pain I've ever felt oh, and really? my ankle blew up like a balloon and I went and at first they told me it was just uh, like 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 a stress fracture or something <laughs> oh man but uh, when you hurt your ankle that bad the tendons are always weaker and so my ankle like, like if I sit with my foot in a certain position for too long or if I stand for too long it gets really really sore still it took like a year to heal like to the best that it could so that was my worst injury it was terrible Ruby did you have anything you wanted to add well actually this is probably the worst that ever happened yeah, explain for our listening audience it was audience. the dumb basketball I was in gym and they were forcing us to play and I didn't want to your fingers all bent she, yeah she's and referring to her pinky finger on her right girl hand threw the ball and was like catch the ball and I was like no and I caught it with my pinky and it bent my pinky and then the dumb the jammed girl, finger the dumb Oh, what the heck? That's literally the last thing you do. It's like the 1940s. Come here, let me put it back. So I went home. Cut it off. (laughs) My mom was like, we should put it in. For you guys who don't know, her finger is, it looks like Harry Potter's scar. It's like, it's like a jagged, yeah. it's, it's, I never noticed <laughs> I that. I never went to urgent care, so it just kind of, it just kind of healed that way. It itself, and that was just now it looks, thing. I mean, that's kind of cool though. But she can reach further angles of the keyboard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she, she can, she can bend it all the way over. She can reach that, uh, that what, the plus sign? Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Dang. No Our, problem. All right, well, that will end Give Me Five for this week. Very, very diverse group of questions in yes, the Give Me Five. Yes, I know. No games, unfortunately, but... It's sorry, because Uberfax is the stupidest game ever invented. Why and don't I'm... athletes play Uberfax? Why don't they? Hot takes. Hot takes. Uh, so next week, we 
we have to watch it. I'm actually very excited. Do you know what movie we're watching? You know, I'm going to let you say it. <laughs> the Mummy. Philip. Ah. Oh, God. Do you, know, do you know what Tom Cruise was in? Which one made his career? Or no, which one was like his first big blockbuster? Mission Impossible? Or no, Top Gun. Top Gun. And you know what? The Iceman cometh. Here we go! It actually uh, looks like it's going to be a genuinely scary movie, though. As, as 2017 is the year of why am I spending this money? Maybe I'll be pleasantly surprised, but... Oh, Just wait till... I actually really like Tom Cruise. Did you like The Edge of Tomorrow? Just I loved Edge of Tomorrow. Wasn't it great? All right, but, sorry. Now, that's a podcast for another day, but The Mummy next week... Maybe maybe our mommies will come on here for the mommy mummy day. The mommy mummy day. Yes. <laughs> oh man, that's a bad idea. <laughs> all right. For chopped greens, we all thank you here. Going around, it has been Ruby, and Gary Boucher. It's been a pleasure, <laughs> and it's been our pleasure. Our pleasure. From chopped greens, I am Philip M. Ryan. Thank you for listening. For more and all of our old episodes. Please visit us on YouTube for all of our archived episodes. Bye.